So a while ago, I did a video that was the top 10 books I hate that everyone else loves. And that one was books that everyone seems to really be into. Like the general consensus is very positive and I just don't like them. Like for one reason or another, I just couldn't stand them. Like I had The Giver, The Road, things like that. And this one, as the title suggests, is going to be the other way around. These are books that I don't necessarily love. I'm not saying that there are no problems with any of these, but I do view most of them in a positive light. There is one entry on this list that I think is bad, but the general consensus for it is like way worse than I feel it should be. And that's basically all these. Like the general consensus for them is way more harsh and negative than I would have thought it should be, but, you know, just, I feel that there's more positive stuff to be said here. Because obviously this is always going to be subjective, it's always going to be a matter of opinion, and I'm not saying I don't understand why people don't like some of these, because again, like, I recognize the problems with a lot of them, and I'll go over those, but sometimes I just, I just don't care about the problems, or I look at them and say, yeah, that's not great, but why are you people so harsh on it? Because I don't know, in this day and age, it seems like people will have a mild distaste for something and then they'll just get locked into an internet echo chamber where they're constantly trying to one-up each other uh, for how much they hate it and how bad they think it is. Like, it's this bad! Oh yeah, it's actually this bad! And just trying to go more and more ridiculous with it until by the end they've just bought into their own hype, essentially, and so they genuinely hate it with a seething passion when before they just had a mild distaste for it. Like, I, that seems to happen a lot. And I don't see it getting better anytime soon, but whatever, that's not important. Uh, we're about to start now, and there will be spoilers for everything I mention here, so be aware of that. Like, there, there's chapters here, you can just skip to the next one if you find something you don't want to get spoiled. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Starting off the list here at number 10, we're gonna have The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. This is the prequel to The Hunger Games, which the movie of it is coming out uh, later this year. Uh, maybe it'll be good, maybe it won't be. And this one is odd to me, because I read it and I was a little disappointed for like the first third to half of the book, because like I said, it's a prequel to The Hunger Games and I wanted it to be about like the origins of Panem, the original rebellion and the origins of The Hunger Games. But that's really not what it is. It's about uh, the origin of President Snow, the primary villain of the original series. And once I got over that this book was not what I wanted it to be, and I just took it for what it was trying to be, I realized, okay, what it, it's trying to do, it's doing extremely well. Like, upon hearing the setup for the story, you would probably just assume that, okay, it's gonna try and make President Snow out to be all sympathetic, and he'll be like, oh, I only became evil because my dad was mean to me. And at first it does kind of seem that way. Like it's like, oh, I suffered so much during the rebellion. Can you believe how much I suffered? It's not like they suffered really. Like they just started it for no reason. Uh, but then as the story goes on, you realize like, oh no, okay, S Snow is just a psychopath. And especially once you get to the ending, you're like, oh yeah, this dude was always just crazy. You know, he, he didn't slowly become crazy over the years of ruling or anything. Like he's just always been entitled and he has always wanted more than he has. And wh when I realized that, I was like, okay, this is a more interesting villain origin story than I originally thought it would be. There are so many parts in this story where it seems like it's going to go like a really traditional route, and then it just goes in a completely different direction. Like the romance, it seems like it's gonna be a you know, traditional, uh, oh, we come from two different worlds, but we just are attracted to each other and we want to make it work, but it turns out much, much different because, again, Snow is just a psychopath and he's willing to sacrifice her in order to go back to his old life where he has, you know, wealth and riches and everything. And so once you understand that, you understand why he's willing to go to such crazy lengths to keep the districts under control and uh, why he fights until the bitter end in the final book. And on top of that, I just appreciate it because for a while, The Hunger Games was the biggest book franchise in the world by a huge margin. Like, Suzanne Collins could have shat out a hundred prequels and sequels and spin-offs and everything, and people would have read them, and she could have cashed in on that like crazy, but she decided not to. You know, like, she wrote a prequel, and it wasn't a super marketable prequel that the fans were clamoring for. It was something that 
she wanted to make and had a part of the story that she wanted to tell. And it does add to the original story. So, I don't know, I just appreciate it for that. Number nine is gonna be Bleach. That is Bleach the manga series, not Bleach the thing you clean clothes with. Now, this is a series that, for whatever reason, has gotten a lot of hate over the years. And I don't mean like people dislike it or they just aren't into it. I mean like genuine hate, especially back when it was still running and it was still really popular. Like a lot of people just despised it so much. And back then I didn't understand why. Now, like, again, I see there's problems with it, but I still don't understand why. Like it is, at least on the surface, a pretty standard shonen battle manga story. You know, you, you have a main character who's a really young person who suddenly gets really crazy powers and then he goes off and fights bad guys with them and the bad guys just get more and more powerful so the heroes have to get more and more powerful to match them and by the end he, he's barely recognizable from what he was at the beginning and he's taken on gods and shit. On the surface that does seem like very traditional shonen stuff and in a lot of ways Bleach is. I'm not trying to say it's like completely subversive or completely different or anything, but it is different in some key ways. Like, for example, the main character Ichigo is not a kid like a lot of them are, or at least a lot of them were at the time that the series was written, because some of this doesn't seem quite as innovative now, because uh, it's like 20 years later, but still, uh, Ichigo is not a kid, he's a teenager, and he's not like super energetic and optimistic and just wanting to go off and like be a Pokemon master or whatever, like he's surly. And at the beginning, it seems almost like he's uh, forced into his role as a Shinigami, and he's forced to go around and help save people. And it's really satisfying to watch him grow from somebody who has this responsibility thrust upon him and looks for any excuse to get rid of it into somebody that accepts it and just decides, he, yeah, he wants to do his part to help save the world. And that's great. Uh, on top of that, the artwork is just fantastic. Like... Again, this is a manga series, so I have to talk about the artwork. Or, well, I guess I don't have to, but whatever. The artwork is fantastic because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In Bleach, a lot of them are worth like three or four thousand. I mean, the way that he can draw characters and give them just so much emotion and so much history in a single panel is incredible. And yeah, admittedly, he does like to not draw backgrounds, which is kind of obnoxious sometimes, but. I'm willing to put up with that because that just means he has more time to spend on giving detail to the character models and everything, and that's great. And then the fights are all amazing too, like, the amount of time between them is perfect. They all get the perfect amount of hype and build up, you know, it's not just getting thrown out there, so we're just being hit with a bunch of noise in, uh, all right in a row. They get a little repetitive, but I mean... It, it's not that big a deal. Like, there's only so many different ways you can have dudes swinging swords at each other anyways. Like, it it didn't bother me that much. Like, the fact that the fights are similar is fine because the build-up to them and the emotional payoff and everything for them is also fine. But on top of all that, Bleach is a bit smarter than people want to give it credit for. Like, for a while I've been contemplating doing a video about how Bleach is really all about religion, specifically how religion works in Japanese society and culture, and I, I might do it at some point, I don't know, but basically one of the ideas that I would put in that is that the series has a lot of really strong Buddhist themes in it. Like, the idea of balance is a huge part of the story. Like, it's not about killing the bad guys in a lot of cases, it's about finding a way to coexist with them, which oftentimes means like killing the leaders of the bad guys and everything, but it doesn't mean subsuming and destroying and taking over uh, other groups. Like, And this is all represented in the character of Ichigo himself, because at the beginning, he's a human, and then he has his Shinigami powers thrust upon him. And at first, he doesn't want them. He tries to get rid of them, but no matter how hard he tries, he just can't get rid of this. It's a part of him, whether he likes it or not. And it's only once uh, Rukia gets taken to the Soul Society and he has to go and rescue her, that he finally accepts these powers and realizes, okay, I, I need to accept this part of myself in order to save my friend, and he unlocks his Zanpakuto and achieves his true potential. Like, uh, he's not giving up his humanity, he's just merging his Shinigami powers with his human side. 
and so they achieve balance. And then later on, he finds out, okay, he also has hollow powers, and at first he tries to subsume that part and destroy it and cast it out, and that doesn't work, so what does he do? Again, he, like, embraces it and makes it a part of himself and brings it into harmony with the other parts. And then in the final arc, we have the same thing with his Quincy powers. And while, yes, it is definitely a bit of an ass pull <laughs> that uh, all of this is him, like, this clearly wasn't planned from the beginning, and you could say that about a lot of parts of Bleach, to be honest, like, once you get to the final arc, like, yeah, some stuff does come together and it does come to a head, but it doesn't feel like, oh yeah, this was all written out from the beginning. However, it still works because the arcs all thematically build on one another and do tie into that idea of balance, you know? And even on top of that, uh, I do kind of like how a lot of the world building is not overly explained, like, it's just kind of hinted at, and a lot of the characters don't understand it that much, so it gives you the sense that this world is much bigger and deeper than we see on the surface. It's just, it's just enjoyable. That's all. I really like Bleach. Number eight is Light Lark, and I just want to remind you all, I don't necessarily like everything on this list. I just think that the general consensus is way harsher than it should be. And Light Lark, I've done multiple videos on it. You can go watch them if you don't believe me. I do not like this this book. It's not good. It is a freaking mess. The characters are... I was going to call them two-dimensional. I think it might be more accurate to call them the outlines of two-dimensional characters. The world makes no sense, and the plot just meanders all over. But overall, I would just say that, yeah, it doesn't make sense, and most of the pieces don't fit together. But that makes it nonsensical. It doesn't make it horrible. You know, like, it's bad because, like, yeah, the character personalities aren't great, the story is kind of a mess and doesn't really lead anywhere until, like, the very end, and the world is doesn't fit together well. So, like, I couldn't get into any of this, but that doesn't make it horrible. Like, I, I wasn't actively offended by any of this, except that it uh, wasted my spare time, uh, which I have increasingly little of as my life goes on. But the thing is... Everyone just despises Lightlark on YouTube, it seems. Like, I, I don't know why people feel the need to make, like, multi-hour long video essays on how awful this book is. Because, like, yeah, it's bad, and yeah, you can point out all the ways in which it doesn't make sense, but I just, I just can't summon the hate for it like a lot of others seem to. And I don't know if I can explain exactly why. Maybe it's just because I do like some of the ideas brought up here. You know, the idea of, like, an island being hidden by a storm for a hundred years at a time, and that storm lifts and then people can travel there in order to fight in a tournament and try and end the curses which have afflicted their kingdoms for hundreds of years now, like, okay, that, that could be, that, that sounds cool, okay? I can't, uh, explain exactly why, but it sounds cool. And then a lot of, like, the individual bits of world building and some of the individual plot points, do sound cool on their own, it's just that the way they're put together doesn't make sense, and they're usually not written in such a way which justifies their inclusion in the story, so it doesn't fit together, and as such, it's a bad book. But I just can't summon the hatred that everyone else has for it. I... I don't know. I, I just can't. And for number seven, we have Rhythm of War. This is the fourth book in the Stormlight Archive, the most recent one as of the time of this recording. And in my personal opinion, the second best in the series. Because Way of Kings is still the best for me, but the Rhythm of War is like right below that. And, again, I understand a lot of the problems people have with this. Those books are crazy long to begin with, and Rhythm of War is the longest by a decent margin. I think it's around 460,000 words. That is insane. Like, how could you possibly just even write that and call it a single book? That's like an entire series. It's it's absolutely ludicrous. I can't. I, I just can't. And large parts of Rhythm of War straight up didn't need to be there or could have been uh, condensed significantly. Like, I, I've heard from people who said like, yeah, it's at times one of the most boring books I've ever read. And I, I feel you on that one. Like, I was into some of the subplots. Like, I was into Kaladin pulling a diehard and just trying to fight bad guys in the magical tower. I, I was into that. I was into Kaladin also trying to essentially invent therapy and become the first psychiatrist in this world. Uh, I especially liked that because 
like, it, it makes it clear that Kaladin has not gotten over his problems, and he probably never will. Like, becoming better and healing is a process that never ends. It's, it's a road that just continues forever. And that ties really closely into one of the central themes of Stormlight Archive, which is journey before destination. The journey is what shapes us. And, they're, like, I got that uh, put on my arm for a reason. I mean, not the journey is what shapes us, but whatever, you get my point. It's a quote from the Stormlight Archives, and uh, Kaladin having to do this, invent this therapy idea is part of that theme. It ties into it very well. And then other parts of it were really obnoxious, but then we also, like, learn more about the world, and we learn a bit more about the nature of magic, and, you know, just things like that, which are really cool. So I was into that, don't get me wrong, but it is really long, and at times really, really boring, and at times it feels like almost like a commercial for later books, as opposed to just being a book right now. But then you get to the ending, and the ending is insane. Like, uh, the main villain of the series, the evil god named Odium, is killed by Teravangian, who is a minor villain in the series, and then Teravangian takes all, on all his powers. And Teravangian is far sh uh, smarter than Odium, and also seems to have a lot more self-control than Odium ever did. And so, he's way more dangerous. Like, we see in the epilogue, he's the first person to ever outsmart Hoyd. Like, Hoyd has been ten steps ahead of everybody else throughout the entire Cosmere, including in the Stormlight Archive. And at the end, Hoyd, or excuse me, at the end, he gets outsmarted by Teravangian. And, I mean, I, I can't help it. That just caught me so off guard. Like, Teravangian stabs him with the magic sword and then takes on his powers, and... It makes total sense, like, it's not the first time in the Cosmere that somebody has taken on the power of a shard after killing their host. Like, I'm sorry if you don't understand what I mean by that, but I just, I do not have the time to go over a lot of Cosmere lore in this video. We just, we just can't. But, the point is, like, it makes sense. It was properly built up to and foreshadowed. Like, they mentioned that Teravangian... Uh, has to have really strong emotions and very strong intellect at the same time, and so he's the only one that can not only take on the powers of Odium, but control them. So that makes perfect sense, and I just really want to know what happens next. Like, the fact that this is an epic fantasy story where the primary villain dies less than halfway through, it just makes me want to know what happens next. I'm sorry, I just loved the ending of Rhythm of War so much that it blows all the other problems I had with it earlier out of the water. Number six, Love Hina. And also, if you're wondering why my thumb is so stiff here, it's because I sprained it yesterday, so I'm just trying not to move it right now. Uh, hopefully I don't have to go to the hospital, because that's expensive. But, yeah, Love Hina. And again, I want to emphasize, I don't necessarily love all of these, but Love Hina, I do have a soft spot for, you know? It is a really dumb harem manga from the 90s, right? It's about a guy who tries to get into school uh, university, and he keeps failing, and he goes to live with his grandmother, but finds out that his grandmother runs a dormitory full of a bunch of other girls who live there, and he just now lives on his own with a bunch of girls. Like, it's, it's something that probably sounds very familiar to you if you have seen any anime or read any manga over the past, like, 30 goddamn years. It's a harem story. You know how it's gonna be. There's gonna be stupid hijinks. There's gonna be some romantic tension, or at least what passes for romantic tension in most manga, uh, between the main character and a whole bunch of girls. Uh, there's gonna be, like, risque shots, there's never actually gonna be any full-on nudity, and characters are never gonna be allowed to actually have sex, but they will be surrounded by it. It, you know how it is. But, the thing about that is that, after a long time it just became a cliché, which has been so done to death, that even joking about how it's been done to death, has been done to death. But, back in the 90s, when Love Hina first came out, that wasn't the case. Like, it hadn't, uh, these tropes hadn't been beaten into the ground yet. And so, they were still relatively fresh. And at the time I read it, it was still relatively fresh to me as well. You see, something becomes a cliché when people stop trying to justify it and just start throwing it into the story because they feel like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Like, that, that's what makes something a cliché, really, as opposed to just being something that you've seen before. And Love Hina was made 
again, at a time where this hadn't really been baked into the entire industry yet. So the author, Ken, Ken Akamatsu, was actually trying to justify it, you know? He was actually giving the characters some personality, and even though they do ridiculous things and go through ridiculous hijinks and everything, their personalities do usually justify it, and this odd world that it takes place in also justifies it. And so I didn't find myself hating all the weird jokes and everything as much because, like, it feels like there's a bedrock for them. It feels like there's a foundation there. Uh, even the tsundere trope, which I despise because it usually just boils down to a girl is really mean to somebody, but he is still in love with her and still treats her very nice and does everything great for her. I don't know. I, I don't like that uh, cliche. I don't like that archetype, but it is done at least passably in Love Hina. And on top of that, I, I can't help it. It's just a cute story. You know, it, it doesn't go on forever. It is a reasonably short manga and like I just liked watching the main couple fall in love and at the end they get married and it genuinely warmed my heart and I had a couple of really dumb laughs along the way because you know, the humor here is extremely juvenile I'll admit and I don't know it's not that deep I just I was into it and if I read this today I would probably not like it very much but again that's just because I've seen similar things done so often, but this was done back when they were still fresh and they were at least trying to do something good and different with them. Number five is going to be The Inheritance Cycle, aka Aragon. Now this one, years ago, I did a video on it explaining why I really liked it, even despite all its flaws, and I stand by pretty much everything in there, you know? It is basically just Star Wars with dragons. You know, like, the, the story is pretty derivative, but it was written by a 15-year-old, like, uh, uh, yeah, what, what would you expect? Like, <laughs> no one is going to write something uh, super world-changing and unique when they're 15. Like, you've all seen the two-and-a-half-hour video I made years ago about the crappy novel I wrote when I was 15. Like, Aragon is leagues beyond anything I could write at the time. And while, yeah, it is basically just... Star, the original Star Wars trilogy, but with dragon riders instead of Jedi. The books are pretty long, and they use that extra time to do different stuff. For example, it spends a lot more time really hammering home that Aragon is just a farm boy who is in way over his head. Like, in the first book, he can't read at the beginning. Like, he has to be taught how to read later on in the story. And other characters are like, oh, yeah, I guess it makes sense he wouldn't know how to read. And that is just... A small detail, but number one, it makes sense in this world because, like, yeah, again, he's, he's a farm boy. Why would he know how to read? But probably more importantly than that, it illustrates that this kid is just being thrown into the deep end. You know, he w has all these powers and the responsibility that comes with those powers thrust upon him uh, kind of out of nowhere, and he has no idea how to deal with it. You know, he doesn't know how to use magic. He doesn't know how to fight. He doesn't know how to read. He doesn't know how to navigate all these politics, and he's probably going to have to be the leader of a new Dragon Rider order, and he knows that from pretty early on in the story, but he has no idea how to do that, and so it's really satisfying to watch him learn to do all this over the course of the story. I mean, if Aragon had just said, oh, I got these powers? Cool. Show me how to use them, and then he'd been, like, super happy and pumped up about it, and he just somehow knew how to read from the beginning, and he somehow knew how to fight at least a little bit from the beginning, then it wouldn't really hammer home as much that, yeah, yeah, this kid's gonna be in trouble and he needs all the help he can get. And on top of that, like, the world, again, it's derivative, cliched, but it has depth to it and it has breadth to it. Like, there are a lot of different races and cultures and locations there. And I did really like how, at the end, it breaks away from the traditional hero's journey format. Because, again, uh, the original Star Wars trilogy has that where the hero leaves home, goes on an adventure, comes back home. A gross oversimplification, but that's the general idea. Uh, and then Aragon, though, in the final book, he realizes, I can't go home. Like, I am a completely different person than I used to be, and even if I wasn't, I have all of this responsibility. I can't just abandon that. So I, I am not that farm boy anymore. And at the end, he leaves home forever. And that was just different. I liked it. And also the romance between him and Arya, I should put quotes around romance, like, is also very different. You know, it, it didn't work out between them because Arya was 
never really into him because he was just really young. He, he's a young child and she's over 100 years old and she just has a much different view of the world than he does. So it's almost like a small school child having a crush on someone much older than them. And on top of all of that, I just really liked that Aragon got me into fantasy. You know, like if I hadn't read this, I don't know if I would have read a lot of other stuff that I've loved over the years. So for that reason, I just love it. Number four is another series of books that I have made a video defending in the past, sort of. Uh, and this is The Mortal Instruments. Now this one, uh, again, I made a video on it, but that one I just concluded that The Mortal Instruments is fine. And I'm talking about the original trilogy there, which is City of Bones, City of Ashes, and City of Glass. Uh, I am not referring to the 18 shit gazillion prequels and spin-offs and sequels that Cassandra Clare has written, because in contrast to Suzanne Collins, who wrote The Hunger Games and just kind of left it at that because she didn't feel the story needed more, Cassandra Clare saw dollar signs and just decided to keep pumping out more and more, and I believe she's still writing more today. And I mean, I guess if people are buying them, then sure, more power to you, but uh, it, it just really detracts from the story when you have the original trilogy and like everything wraps up and they're like, oh no, actually there's more after that. There's a lot to complain about here. I hate Jace, <laughs> the main love interest of the story. I, I hate him. He is an asshole to everyone all the time for no reason. And the story treats that as like, oh, he's snarky because his dad was mean to him. You know, he has to have this harsh exterior in order to hide the sweet, sensitive soul that's inside, except they never show us the sweet, sensitive soul, so, you know, there's not a whole lot to, to like about him there. Uh, I did like some of the world building, like them, uh, you know, putting runes on their skin in order to give themselves power was kind of cool. Uh, the way that the different races, like vampires and werewolves and uh, shadow hunters, all coexisted was pretty cool as well. I, I liked some of that. Uh, I did like uh, the climax at the end where Clary confronts Valentine, uh, but then at the same time, again, there's many more problems, like how they're supposed to be demon hunters, but they do very little demon hunting. Uh, the weird pseudo-incest subplot is bizarre and not handled super well. The main romance isn't great, but at the same time, there's just there's genuinely stuff I liked here. You know, I, I liked that uh, other characters also got to have romances, which were fairly well written. Uh, it wasn't just Jace and Clary being focused on all the time, like the other side characters and other members of the main cast also got to have their own little love stories, which were halfway decent. Uh, I did like some of the fighting and action bits. Like, there wasn't a whole lot of them, but they were cool. Uh, I did like the villain, Valentine, who... There, there's not a lot to him, but he has some cool bits. Uh, and like I said, I like the climax of the series at the end where Clary manages to summon uh, the angel whose name is escaping me right now and just uses him to uh, take out her dad. Uh, I did like... Uh, again, I didn't like the pseudo-incest plot line. That was kind of weird, but I did genuinely feel bad for Jason and Clary because they think that they're siblings for a while and they still have these really strong attraction to one another and they're trying to fight against that and just like they're not sure how to deal with it like I did feel bad for them and I think that was the point but I think the main reason I have a soft spot for the mortal instruments even though so many other people have just hated on them for years is that I've also seen a lot of other young adult fantasy over the years and let me tell you it can get so much worse <laughs> like a lot of young adult fantasy, like Throne of Glass and such, is just so soulless and so paint by numbers and so just not even trying that I look at something like Mortal Instruments, which has a lot of flaws and a lot of stupid bits and a lot of things that make me cringe, but at the same time it does feel earnest enough that I just have to say, you know what, you were, you were trying something there. And plus, it, it has a pretty equal focus on romance and, like, the actual story. You know, it doesn't just have romance overtake everything, like, again, a lot of young adult fantasy does. So, I I feel like I should hate Mortal Instruments more than I do, but honestly, just comparing it to what it could be, I, I, ju I just don't. I think Mortal Instruments is fine. Number three is The Death Cure, and that is The Death Cure as in the final book in the Maze Runner series. And 
you could kind of put just the series as a whole on here, but the thing is people will generally think the first two books are fine. And you know what, I'll defend both the books and the movies. They're pretty different from one another, but they are enjoyable in their own ways. But talking about the first two books, people will point out plenty of problems, which I agree with, like how the world building makes very little sense and the story doesn't have a great setup, even if like the events and the pacing and everything are pretty good and working towards the end goal is pretty good and the mystery in the first book is pretty good. Like, people will point out problems, but then also point out the positives. So the overall consensus on the Maze Runner books is, yeah, they're, they're all right. There's a couple people that really like them, a couple people that really hate them, but they just think, yeah, they're okay, except for the Death Cure, which a lot of people seem to hate. And I'm not sure why, because at the end, Thomas uh, realizes, along with some others, that they're not going to be able to make a cure for the flare virus, which is essentially a zombie virus, if you haven't read them or seen the movies. Uh, and all they can do is take the small percentage of people who are immune, take them somewhere far away so that they can escape the collapse of civilization, and then they just wait for the rest of the world to die, and then they can rebuild. And it's a bit of a downer ending, yeah, and I think that's part of why people don't like it. They just don't like downer endings, they prefer something happier, which, I mean, if you do, more power to you. Um, but I also think part of the reason people don't like it is because they were mistakenly thinking that Thomas, the main character, was working towards making a cure, and then he doesn't do it at the end. But Thomas wasn't. Like, the villains were working towards making a cure, and they were torturing all the characters in order to do so. And Thomas was just trying to save himself and his friends. And in fact, in the last book, he straight up comes out and says, I don't care if we have to let the entire world die, it is wrong to torture people like this. And that's... you can disagree with that, I probably would, if I... that he was a real person. But you can't deny that that's a very strong, uh... trait, let's say, for a main character to have. And going into the ways in which the movies are different than the books, like, again, I do enjoy the movies, but I didn't like the ending of the last one quite as much, because in the last movie, there is actually a cure that's made. Like, it's made from Thomas's blood, but it's just, it comes way too late, and it doesn't uh, actually save anybody. Like, Thomas gets the cure, but then he and the others have to go off to an island away from everybody else, and then they're still waiting out to the death of humanity. And it, it seems to end kind of ambiguous, like, oh, maybe Thomas will go out and try to make more of the cure in order to save people, but, like, obviously there's nothing after that in the story, so we're not going to get more. And I feel like that kind of misses the point of the ending of the book, because th there's a scene in the movie where he just really dramatically yells, THERE IS NO CURE! And they, like, showed that in every fucking trailer before it came out. Uh, but t the thing is, that was the point. You know, in the book, at least. That, that, that was the point. There is no cure. No matter what they did, they weren't going to find a cure for the flare virus. Like, sometimes things are broken, and you can't fix them. All you can do is get out of the way. Like, we, we all pay for the mistakes of others. We, we pay for the mistakes of powerful people who live now. We pay for the mistakes of our loved ones who live now. We pay for the mistakes of our ancestors who died hundreds of years ago. Like, we're still feeling the ramifications of some of that. And there's no avoiding that. Sometimes all you can do is get out of the way of the disaster. And, like, that is the message at the end of the Death Cure, or at least the one I took from it. And that's a very powerful one. So, uh, again, in addition to the ending catching me off guard, because it really did, I just really liked that. It made me stop and think for a while. Number two is An Ember in the Ashes. And despite being number two on this list, I don't think I have a whole lot to say about this series. Like, it is overall good, I think. Like, I wouldn't say it's amazing, with the exception of the first book, which I do genuinely think is great. Uh, but overall, it's like, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. And I don't have a whole lot of justification why, uh, other than that it feels very earnest. Because, again, this is another young adult fantasy series, and, again, I've seen just how awful those can get. And An Ember in the Ashes does follow a lot of the, like, cliches we would expect from that genre nowadays, but it does them, like, kind of similar to the Mortal Instruments, it does them earnestly. You know? Like, at the beginning of the first book, 
main character girl's grandparents are killed, like her, her parents are already dead long ago, and her older brother gets kidnapped and she escapes, and so she goes on this quest to rescue her sibling, which is something we've probably seen a lot. Like, again, that's just the Hunger Games still echoing throughout the larger culture. But anyways, the point is, uh, she's going out to save her sibling, and she does that by being a spy in a place full of wealthy people, which is, again, something we've seen a lot, but hey, it, at least it feels earnest, you know? And that's the thing. Everything that happens in these books feels earnest. Like, the characters don't feel like they're just meant to fill an archetype. They feel like a person who just happens to fit into that archetype and also breaks away from it in some small ways. Not, not in big ways, but in small ways. Uh, the storyline and the world building as well also feel like yeah, they're, they're following stuff we've seen before, but it does break out of it in some small ways, and there is justification for it. So, like, that's what I mean when I say it feels earnest at the end of the day. Uh, on top of that, it's not generic medieval European fantasy world. It is based much more on uh, Middle Eastern mythology and folklore, which is, you know, a, a little bit different at the very least. That's kind of cool. I did like that. But probably the number one thing which really made me actually get into this series and care about what was happening, is that it doesn't half-ass the fact that this is a very dangerous, deadly situation that the characters are in, and a lot of them are going to die. Like, it, it doesn't. There are a lot of books, especially ones aimed at younger audiences, where they try to act like things are super deadly dangerous, but then they will not have any characters die, or they'll have one, maybe two die near the end, uh, or they'll just have like, one die at the very beginning to show, oh, look, anyone can go, but then the, everyone is just fine after that, you know what I mean? Uh, whereas Ember in the Ashes, people meet horrible fates throughout. You know, like, the villains do not shy away from the fact that they're committing a genocide throughout half the series. And people are on the receiving end of that. And sometimes they get, like, heroic last stands, where they get to be the heroes one last time before finally succumbing and then they manage to let their friends escape. Other times, they just die. And it doesn't really lead to anything. Like, sometimes the villains just kill them to make a point. And, uh, again, because these are actual characters that I was kind of into, I felt bad for them. And I also felt bad for the main characters who, like, these, they're losing their friends and loved ones. So, it doesn't half-ass it, you know? It doesn't uh, pretend to be dark and gritty and then act all lighthearted and sweet like Throne of Glass often did. It is just kind of a dark story at times. Or, I say kind of. Again, there's a genocide here. Uh, like, it is a dark story, and it doesn't shy away from that, but at the same time, it doesn't revel in being dark and gritty. It is just characters trying to find light in the darkness. You know, that that's uh, where the title of the series comes from. It's an ember in the ashes. Like, it's all dark, but there is one little spark of hope which you can use to start a fire. And the number one book that I love that everyone else seems to hate is The Dinosaur Lords. <laughs> I've mentioned this multiple times. Like, I read this series a little over a year ago, and I've brought it up several times since then because it's a, it's a great series. It, unfortunately, it's only half of a series, really, because the author wrote three books and then died before he could write the next three, because he planned for there to be six. And that is very unfortunate. But the first three are just so great that I don't care that much. You know? It is, as the title suggests, it's about knights who ride dinosaurs and fight each other, and they also fight evil angels who bring down hordes of undead. Well, not exactly undead, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and religious fanatics to just exterminate all of humanity. And that's awesome. I can't help it. That's just awesome. It actually surprised me after I finished reading this series and I looked at other reviews of it online to see that people didn't seem to like this one that much. It got pretty mixed reviews and it never really took off in terms of popularity either, which is, I think, the main reason why we're not seeing the rest of them. Like, you know, they could hire somebody to finish off the series, but that's just not going to happen uh, because it's not that popular. It's not going to make much money. But it's just, it's so good. <laughs> like, one thing I really appreciate about it, in addition to just having a bunch of cool shit, because, again, it's knights riding dinosaurs. <laughs> What's not to like about that? One of the main villains is a knight who rides an albino T-Rex named Snowflake into battle. <laughs> 
<laughs> what? That, that just makes my inner 10 year old go, oh yeah, it's so cool. But one thing I do appreciate on top of that is that it's not really a fantasy story. It is a science fiction story disguised as a fantasy story because th this is kind of a cliche at this point, uh, but it comes to light over the course of the story that this is some point far in the future and they're not on Earth, they're on another planet which was colonized by humans and all of the magic we see is actually just very advanced technology. Like, the evil angels who are trying to wipe out humanity are implied to just be some sort of androids. It's... It's weird, but okay, kind of interesting. And it's... It, it works better than a lot of other things that try to do this because normally it's like a big twist near the end of the story where it's like, oh my gosh, it's science fiction. It was Earth all along. What? That's crazy. But it's usually, even if it's foreshadowed, it winds up detracting from a lot of the story. Whereas in this case, it is... N none of the characters come right out and say it because none of them seem to know it. It is just hinted at from the beginning. And if you pay attention, you can figure it out yourself and go, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. But why is the world like this? And instead it just opens a mystery. And that mystery is part of why I wanted to keep reading. And unfortunately we never got it you know, revealed, but still it's cool. All of the fights and battles in here are just fantastic, especially the giant battle at the end of book two. That's just straight up one of the best I've ever read. And if we just count like battles in epic fantasy, that would have to be easily top three, I think. <laughs> like, there's not many others that would go above that. It, it is amazing. Uh, and part of the reason it's so amazing is because this series does, like, a different take on a zombie apocalypse formula for a while, which is not something you see often. Like, zombie apocalypse is something that has been done a lot. It, it's been done to death. <laughs> uh, but it, it's not something you see where uh, that has any real changes to it most of the time. It is usually stuff we've seen a hundred times over, but this was different because a gray angel comes down and starts a gray angel crusade, which is, you know, go out and kill a bunch of sinners. And a lot of people join with him out of like genuine religious devotion. They're like, oh yes, we have to go kill the sinners. We, we shall do that. Yes, of course. Uh, and then some people feel coerced into it. Like, eh, I don't want to join, but there's an angry army that says join or die. I'll just join up with them and go along with them. Uh, which, it's hard to blame them for doing that. And then there's a whole bunch of people who are just straight up brainwashed by the angel. Like, and they don't turn into mindless husks like you imagine when you hear zombies. Like, they are still themselves. They have all the same thoughts and they can still talk and use weapons and tools and everything. They're exactly as they were before, except that they just have this insane religious fervor inside them and they will not stop until they've killed everyone in in their path, as the angel tells them to. Like, you can cut off their legs, they will crawl after you and try clawing you to death with their bare hands. Like, it, it's scary to think about, but it is way different than any other zombie apocalypse thing I've seen before. And so that's when we get the giant battle at the end of book two, where a whole bunch, this, just a gigantic horde of these people is coming up against an army, and the giant horde is also uh, riding velociraptors, and the angel is riding an Indominus Rex, which is like a T-Rex, but bigger, and just, it's, it's so cool. Like, at the end of the day, that's what this boils down to. Like, a lot of people just thought the Dinosaur Lords was stupid. I didn't care. It was just, there's so much cool stuff. It, it makes me giddy, and I loved it, and I really wish we could see an ending to it. We're not going to, but you know what? Journey before destination, you know, it, I just love the, the Dinosaur Lords so much, and if you don't like it, uh, bite my shiny metal ass. <laughs> and I don't know, uh, do you have anything like this, you know, book series or comic series or anything like that where everyone seems to really dislike it, the general consensus is sharply negative, but you just really like it, or otherwise you just don't see where all the hate comes from, you know? Just, I don't know, let, let me know down below. And also rate the video and comment and subscribe on it. Because uh, I'm supposed to say that at the end here. And also, uh, follow me on social media and stuff. Look at me <laughs> promoting myself like you're supposed to. And, yeah, that's about all. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Wow, you, you're still watching? I, I mean, I guess I appreciate it, but I'm not sure why. I mean, at this point, all that we have left is all these names here. These are my patrons, and including my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine. Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dawn, Dio, Echo, Flax, Karkat Kitsune, 
Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micah Phone, Mist Boy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. These are all great people. You know, let me let me just let me tell you. If you want to get your name on here, then consider donating to me once a month. Become a patron. Or if you don't feel like doing that, or you just can't because you know you're like poor or whatever no shame in that uh then just you know rate the video comment on it subscribe share it around spam it to all your friends and uh yeah goodbye